So, just to summarize, it turns out that most of the effect of being a better student can be attributed to these top five or six habits. The more times you, better your retention of that material. And so what we know based on this study, and I'll provide a link to it in the show note captions, is that there are at least 10 study habits that the highly effective students use. I'm gonna focus on the top five or six, just for sake of time. First of all, they set aside time to study. They literally schedule time to study. Now this probably serves several roles. The first one is that they are able to clear out other distractions. And in fact, that's the second thing that they do. They are very effective where they make it a point of putting their phone away and off, of isolating themselves, that's right, they're not studying with other people, they study alone, which is not to say that people who study with others cannot be effective in their studying, but the best performing students seem to study alone. They put their phone away, they tell their friends and families that they are not going to be able to be reached during that time. Yes, they study for three or four hours per day, but they break that up into a couple of different sessions, typically two or three sessions. So they're not doing a three or four hour studying about all in one shot. So they're managing their time, they're eliminating distractions, and they're studying for a consistent amount of time, at least five days per week. The other thing that they do, and this is very important, is that they make an effort to then teach their peers, to teach other students in the class. It's very clear that students who make it a point to learn material in isolation then bring that material to other students in the same course and teach them perform exceedingly well in comparison to the other students so don't be afraid to be a teacher of your peers in order to test this is key to test and develop mastery of the material so going back to this idea that the best students set aside time they designate time to study alone that is sure to help them anchor their focus and attention. They know that they're going to need to use their focus and attention during that time. And we know with absolute certainty that focus and attention are a limited but renewable resource in the human brain. The longer you're awake, the more is the buildup of a molecule called adenosine in your brain and body. It makes you sleepy, makes it harder to focus. When you sleep, adenosine levels are pushed down again. You're able to focus again. You feel more alert. You can think of adenosine as limiting your attentional budget, which is not to say that some people don't study best in the afternoon or in the evening or even late at night, right? I recall times during university when I'd study between the hours of 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Scheduling time where you know you're going to need to be focused and attending is perhaps one of the most important things toward being able to focus and attend to the material. Now, if you're taking courses, you probably are going to be a slave to the timing of the courses. You aren't going to be able to tell the instructor, okay, listen, I want you to do this course at you know uh, 3 p.m. because that's when you learn best. However, to the extent that you have any control over the time in which you're going to study, keeping that at a regular time or times, perhaps one block early in the day, one block later in the day, perhaps two blocks early in the day and so on, is going to be beneficial. It turns out that's also supported by the research literature that the brain, just like with its sleep-wake cycles that entrain to a regular schedule, that is your brain and body get used to being active and inactive at particular times based on your exposure to sunlight, exposure to activities, your social rhythms, etc. If you regularly, meaning for the course of about three days, Make it a point to focus and study at particular times. Again, pulling your attention back. It's not an automatic process, but pulling your attention back to a specific location, perhaps on a page or that you're listening to in a lecture, your body and brain will start to entrain to that rhythm such that you will be able to focus and attend better simply by virtue of the regularity of the timing of the exposure to the material. Okay, so you probably need about two or three days to break into a regular schedule of focusing and attending and studying at a given time or times. Allow yourself that transition period, but then make it a point to schedule those times to study. Set aside your phone, tell people you're going offline, turn off the Wi-Fi if you need to or have to. You may need it for your studying, I don't know. It depends on what you're studying, but limit distractions at all costs and learn to just focus on the material. This is a skill. This is the most important thing to understand. It's a skill to be able to focus and study. And it's a skill that you can learn very quickly, especially if you schedule it for regular times and you give yourself two or three days in which to adapt to those schedules and times and then try and stick to them as regularly as possible. Perhaps even on the weekends, if you're approaching you know, the end of the quarter or semester, perhaps even 
on the weekend, even if you're not in the quarter or semester. Keeping those regular times will entrain your nervous system to study and learn at its best at those particular times. So a key theme in all of the excellent literature, that is the peer-reviewed research on how best to study, is that studying that feels challenging is the most effective. I know nobody wants to hear this. Everyone wants to hear about flow. Everybody wants to hear about information just sinking into their brain by osmosis. We've known for hundreds, if not thousands of years, that effort is the cornerstone of learning. So I know there are probably some groans about that. I know some of you perhaps were hoping that today I was gonna tell you how to study so that studying wasn't painful. But in order to do that, let's take a quiz. Again, you can answer these questions in your head. You don't have to tell anyone, but you could write them down or say them out loud if you want. The first question is, when does the remodeling of neural connections occur? I like to think this is a pretty easy one. The answer is during sleep. The second question is, what is one behavioral tool that you can use to improve focus? The answer is simple mindfulness meditation, which I'd prefer you think of simply as a perceptual exercise. So again, just sit or lie down, close your eyes, focus on your breath when your attention drifts, bring your attention back to your breath and so on. And then the third question is, can you name or list off in your mind three tools that the most effective students have been shown to use? Limiting distraction by virtue of putting away phones and telling others you won't be in contact with them. Two, and I'm getting these out of order, I realize, is to isolate, to study alone. And the third that I can recall is to teach others in the same course. Now, why are we taking these silly little quizzes? Well, if ever there was a strongly research supported tool in the literature, in the peer reviewed literature about how students can learn information better, it's testing. I know, I know, I know. We think of tests as a way to evaluate our knowledge, but it turns out that testing is one of the best ways to build our knowledge, to retain our knowledge, and again, to offset forgetting. I think it's nice to think about a more recent study of how best to study. And this study looked at whether or not studying material four times, so study, 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 was better in terms of locking that information into people's minds, allowing them to use that information flexibly, which is an element of creativity, essentially giving them mastery of the material, then a different group which studied once, studied the material twice, studied the material three times, then was tested on the material, or a third group that studied material once, then took one, two, yes, three tests on the material. So what's analyzed and compared between these different groups is their performance on that final test. Based on everything I've told you thus far, you can probably guess who performed best on the test that occurred some period of time later. Performance on that final test was essentially proportional to the number of tests one had already taken on the material. Okay, so the more tests that you take as a way to expose you yourself to the material, the better you're going to perform on that material at some later point. Now, of course, at some point, you have to be exposed to the material for the first time, right? That's why it's studying and learning. But after one exposure to new material, taking more tests on that material, even if you don't perform that well on those tests, as long as you're able to see the accurate answers to those tests and compare your answers to those answers will lead to better performance on the ultimate test and retention of that material at some later time. That's what's going to lead to the most pervasive change, the most durable change, we should say, in your neural circuits that carry that material, that hold that material in your mind, what we call neural encoding. The more times you test yourself or that you are tested on material, the better your retention of that material. But you know what's even more surprising and a little scary and that we all should know and I wish I had learned when I was like in the second grade is that if you ask students, how confident are you in the material that you just learned? How well do you think you would perform on a test? What you see consistently in these studies, I'm chuckling because it's kind of mind blowing is that the students who study the material, that is who were exposed to the material four times think that they are going to perform best on the ultimate exam. However, the students that study the material once and then are tested three times on that material, they think that ultimately they're gonna perform least well. They report, that is the students in the study test, test, test 
group report much lower confidence in the material, much lower sense of mastery of the material compared to the students that were exposed to the material four times who are saying, yeah, I think I would do pretty well or very well. But guess what? Testing yourself once, twice, maybe three times prior to the ultimate test of your knowledge of that material is far and away the best way to lock that material into those neural circuits.